If you follow track and field or really sports media in general, you may have heard about the World Championship Men's 110 meter hurdle final where this happened. Now, false starts have happened to the best athletes to ever live, and some of these have shown to be without a shadow of a doubt on the onus of the athlete. With that said, this race doesn't appear to be that way. Even with the slowest of replays, all starters look like they came off the blocks properly. Yet, it's American sprinter and Eagles wide receiver, Devin Allen, that supposedly false started, and was disqualified for competing for a world championship medal as a result. Now, how much did he false start by? Well, according to the electronic systems, he was .001, or a thousandth of a second too fast. Tinia Gaither from the Bahamas and St. Lucia's Julian Alfred were also disqualified as they were said to have false started as well, despite having relatively clean starts. These instances, particularly Allen's, were met with tons of angry track fans appalled, and this brought to light a role in sprinting that some didn't know or remember the exact numbers of, which was this 100 millisecond threshold a human supposedly can't react faster than. Here's what Allen, among other sprinters, had to say about it. You know, there's a lot of margin error there, there and the fact that there's no... You know, not I'm not going to say leeway, but you, you know, say that the equipment's 100 percent perfect, right? One one thousandth is, is pretty close to the to the limit. You know, I'm one one thousandth slower, and no one, you know, everybody's happy. Everybody's hey, great race, you know, world champ, and that's that. So you are not set completely still. They will pick it up. Something that's been happening in a lot of college and a lot of meets that don't got official, you know. They don't got official sensors in there. They've been getting away with murder. I've seen five false starts in pro professional running, and I'm just like, mm, y'all ain't gonna be able to pull that off at the, the World Championships. Not at all. Um, I'm on Devin's side. I, I didn't think he false started at all, um, but obviously I was in the race and technology said otherwise. In sprinting, you might think, well, every second counts, right? And that statement on its own holds true. But we have to think a bit broader here. What is the actual fastest time you can come out of the blocks in sprinting? And better yet, is this 100 millisecond number a thoroughly researched value backed by numerous studies? The answer to the second question you will find is, frankly, quite concerning. But there are more technical aspects under the surface that make this rule even more suspicious. If you're not familiar with how sprinting works in the first place, it basically goes like this. The starter will give three commands on your marks, set, and then some sort of noise normally resembling a gunshot that happens right behind the athletes' blocks. In this order, the athletes get into position to line up on the blocks comfortably, then they'll lift their hips up, and on the gun, they'll come out of the blocks and begin their race. If you start too early, you're disqualified, or a reset will happen depending on what the starter saw. Go too late, and well, you got a lot of work to do. The official ruling for how fast you can come out of the blocks is no faster than 100 milliseconds or a tenth of a second. The timing for this starts when the gun goes off and ends when the athlete has exerted a specific amount of force on the blocks, as these are hooked up to an electronic system, aka a start information system, that will immediately detect if a false start occurred or not. The reason why a reaction time threshold exists in the first place is because statistically speaking, someone could time their sprint just mere milliseconds after the gun goes off, giving them an absurd advantage in an event that can separate placements by fractions of a second. The problem is that the 100 millisecond number they chose isn't backed up by much at all. In fact, World Athletics pretty much got this nice round number from studies and races done decades ago. As far as anyone is concerned, World Athletics has never directly stated where they got their 100 millisecond threshold from. But in this biomechanical report from the 2018 Women's 60 Meter Indoor Championships, it appears they cite tests done in West Germany in the 60s, where they had hundreds of measurements done, along with it being used in races around that time too. They found that no one was going slower than 120 milliseconds, so they made the limit 110, only to lower it to 100 eventually. Legendary hurdler Colin Jackson had been noted to have consistently fast reaction times, but was said to have false started in the 60 meter hurdle indoor European championships for reacting 90 milliseconds after the gun, only to react 102 milliseconds after the gun to win the indoor title seconds after. Ну что же, хорошо Печенкин взял старт, ну-ну-ну, не берусь определить. 
Another study people point to that the IAAF most likely utilized is a study done in Finland in 1990, just a year after they adopted the 100 millisecond limit and a year before the IAAF officially included it in the rulebook. The study analyzed eight Finnish sprinters who each did three starts. Like we said before, the way reaction timing is measured here is from the second the gun goes off until a specific amount of force is applied on the blocks, which in this study is 10% above the athlete's average pre-tension force. This is just the amount of force an athlete is exerting on the blocks just before the gun goes off, whereas the force threshold, or FTH, is reaching that 10% upon the gun going off. The study concluded that the average reaction time under this measurement was 120 milliseconds for the front leg and 119 with the back leg. Based on this study alone, it's not out of the ordinary to set 100 milliseconds as the absolute lowest an athlete can react to. But here's the issue. Not only does this study focus on just a few finished sprinters, but if we go back to that 2018 report, they were constantly changing the force requirement, which in that case drastically alters the reaction time values, and you logically cannot compare any of these numbers as a result, as just a few kilograms difference can drastically alter reaction time values. This 2018 report becomes even more confusing, because a decade before this, another study came out from the same person who conducted the finished one. In 2009, World Athletics themselves commissioned the same head of the last study to see if their 100 millisecond reaction limit had held up. Instead of the 10% rule like last time, they utilized a specific force detection number of 25 kilograms or 55 pounds, which should assume that the IAAF was using that standard at this time since they funded it. While they noticed a few athletes were still not able to crack that 100 millisecond threshold, some were able to get in the range of anywhere from 80 to 90 milliseconds. This new study references another study from 2002 that something called the startle or moral reflex can effectively bypass the auditory and motor cortices your body processes beforehand that results in a much faster reaction time. Overall, with a 25 kilogram force requirement, athletes can get under 100 milliseconds relatively easily. And given how this study only looked at Finnish athletes, it's not an absurd assumption to make that the best of the best can produce these numbers as well. They concluded that the IAAF should lower their threshold to as far down as 80 to 85 milliseconds to prevent athletes from getting unfairly disqualified. And there's an article from sports scientist Bas van Huren that calculates the theoretical limit to be right around there. There's another issue at hand though. While this study utilized the 25 millisecond force threshold the IAAF supposedly utilized in the past, this is simply not a reality anymore. World Athletics claims timing systems use an algorithm, but do we have public access to these algorithms? This is where I need to introduce the two titans of track timing, Seiko and Omega. Seiko is a Japanese electronics company that's been around for almost 150 years. They create watches, clocks, jewelry, all sorts of stuff that has made them a multi-billion dollar company. Eventually, they made their way into the athletic sphere in the 1980s and has been a staple at the World Championships among other international events. Omega is another company that has been around for decades with a stronghold on timing the Olympics since the 30s. These two companies practically have a duopoly on the current timing systems and track. With that said, neither of these companies have ever released how much force is required to trigger when the athlete's reaction timing ends. But it's been noted in that 2018 report that it's most likely an algorithm. There is a video that exists published by Cycle themselves of their UI, but there's no force measurement on the graph. What happens though when systems like this crumble pretty badly? The U.S. Olympic trials for the 2020 Olympics, held in 2021 because of the pandemic, was one of the strangest meets in athletics history. And while Psycho nor Omega timed these events, the systems used for these nowadays are most likely uniform to meet the IAAF standards. I haven't been able to locate every single live stream of the event, unfortunately, but I was able to find the most egregious examples of what seems to be objectively bad equipment at hand here. The timing company for this meet is Finnish Links, who I've worked with the U.S. Olympic trials for quite a while now. We'll start with Heat 2 of the women's 100 meter semifinals. This one was pretty obvious, as even the commentators pointed out Gabby Thomas in lane 4, coming out of the blocks well before anyone else did. But what if I told you it wasn't her, but rather the woman next to her, Aaliyah Hobbs in lane 3? Now you might not catch it initially, but notice how Hobbs puts slight pressure on the blocks with both her legs just before the gun goes off. Even if she wasn't the first one out of the blocks, she was the first one to put enough pressure on the blocks just before the gun went off. She was not given a green card, and the results do not show her reaction time either. Day 8, men's 110 meter hurdles for First round, Heat 4. Trey Holloway in lane 1 registers a reaction time of 92 milliseconds, but gets a green card and the heat resets. Then it happens again, then a third time where it registers Holloway at 8 milliseconds, which would clearly be grounds for disqualification and someone obviously jumping the gun. But everyone knew this was just faulty hardware at hand here. By the fourth time, another false start is called, but this time it's Samuel Brixey in lane 4. He displays a slight flinch, but again, no blatant sign of directly coming out of the blocks any faster than the rest of the field. 
Holloway's next time going, he comes out of the blocks in a normal 171 milliseconds. Maybe the angles make it difficult to tell for some of these, but we haven't even gotten to the most absurd one yet, which was the three consecutive false starts in the women's 400 meter hurdles. Now, if you watch the 400 meter hurdles, you know that false starts are an obscene rarity, especially at the elite level. There's no need to inch out that thousandth or a hundredth of a second, nor is it worth the risk of trying to time it that perfectly. Shannon Meisberger, however, false started three times in a row. This one's a bit odd too because there's no flinching necessarily, but rather Meisberger adjusting her starting position last second just before the gun goes off. She's never taking off before anyone else, but it's that little change, that force output that triggers the threshold much quicker than the other runners who have a stricter starting stance. At its absolute strictest, you can argue some of these are genuine false starts, but I want to go back to Devin Allen's clip and see if we could find anything similar. I have watched this start frame by frame multiple times, and his start genuinely looks identical to the athletes around him down to the frame, as he shows virtually no genuine changes in force on the blocks to trigger them early, and the rules even state that the SISs are used to assist in a starter making the correct decision, which honestly, I don't think they did. If you don't think my US Olympic trials comparison is fair, upon some data aggregation, someone noted that 25 athletes during the world championships were under 150 milliseconds during the 100 meter and 100 110 hurdles, whereas in the last five world championships, a total of five athletes registered these numbers during these two events. This is not a statistical blip. This would be in the eyes of academia a faulty variable at play, which in this case was highly likely the start information systems that were used for this year and most likely for the 2020 Olympic trials as well. Here's what I've concluded from the evidence and information that currently exists regarding sprinting reaction times and the start information systems. First, the 100 millisecond value is an arbitrary number that dates back decades ago and has no substantial backing to it. Secondly, it's been proven within anecdotal evidence that sub 100 millisecond reactions are possible with a 25 kilogram threshold on the blocks, something that the IAAF has claimed to have used in the past, along with auditory reflexes in general reaching much lower numbers via startle reflex or genuinely good reaction times. Third, the IAAF AAF noted on multiple occasions that this 100 value is a notable probability of needing change from a logical standpoint. Fourth, the current timing systems that run the top meets in the world no longer provide information about their start information systems, especially their force production requirements. Lastly, there have been more than a few instances of what appear to be amplified reaction times via oversensitive blocks from athletes that don't have super strict starting positions or just faulty equipment at hand. With all that said, we will assess one more time. Did Devin Allen false start? In the eyes of the current rules, yes. But upon reviewing the footage and the research behind the very number that disqualified him, he should not have been disqualified and should have been given a second chance to run. How Devin didn't get a green or yellow card for this is beyond me, but this will go down as one of the biggest blunders in track and field history. I understand that sprinting is an incredibly complex and technical type of event that requires a trained eye, but philosophically speaking, there are some glaring flaws within the current system that governs how sprinting works. It's also incredibly sketchy that said companies refuse Refuse to release such critical info, and hopefully this was the breaking point that will initiate some change, whether it's further research or a complete rule overhaul. Even if it's rare, things like this can happen, and rules and equipment like this just can't linger with such flaws for decades by track evangelists who think their say is final and that no further change is required. I want to believe that the IAAF has the athletes' best interest, but the 100 millisecond rule in particular has shown in the past by the IAAF's own word to be questionable on multiple occasions, and the algorithms used to detect force production on the blocks might need some tweaking too. I have hope that World Athletics will truly recognize the scope of this issue and will provide some transparency down the line. Let me know what you guys think in the comments. I'm sure there's something I missed or left out, but hopefully this paints the general gist of the current situation and my thoughts on it. Thank you to all my patrons for supporting the channel, and if you want to support for more content like this, come on over and become a patron. Drop a sub and peep the Instagram too. I'll see you on whatever video I upload next, and take care.